welcome. I am Michelle LeClaire, Executive Director of Buckham Gallery. I am so happy to have everyone here uh, this morning on a Saturday morning um, uh, in 1984. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here today for the sixth annual college lecture. And today's guest speaker is Teresa Dunn um, about the Smallage Fund for the Arts. The Smallage Family Fund was established in 2015 in honor to honor the memory of Bernice Smallage and her passion for the arts and the arts community in the Flint area. This perpetual restricted fund is maintained by the continued do continual donations of family members and friends. The, an the endowed funds the annual Smallage Family Lecture, a yearly arts related talk hosted by Bachman Gallery. Next, I would like to thank all of you for being here today and to the individuals and organizations who support the Buckham Fine Arts Project um, and Gallery, including the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, the Michigan Arts and Culture Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Greater Flint Arts Council Share Art Grant. You know what to find your tax dollars at work. Um, Teresa Dunn is a painter. She received her MFA from the Indiana University Bloomington in 2002. She is a three-time recipient of the Elizabeth Greenshield Foundation Fellowship. I said I talked too fast. My heart should take over my words. <laughs> um, was a Jacob J. Javits. Javits Fellow and was recently awarded grants from the Puffin Foundation and the Sustainable Arts Foundation. Please join me in welcoming. I'm really pleased to be able to share a little bit with you about uh, my work and myself and where the ideas come from. And um, generally when I give these talks, I like them to be conversational. So if you have questions or um, observations as we're talking, please feel free to share them. You can uh, raise your hand or if there's a, a convenient pause, feel free to just um, speak up because we don't have to save all the questions to the end because I feel like um, the, the work um, is a conversation uh, with myself and the larger culture, and, um, and this is a conversation with, with you all, too. So um, I'm going to begin talking a little bit, actually. Um, the work that you see in the gallery is a part of a larger body of work um, called uh, US, capital U, capital S. And um, the, they were painted between generally um, all the work in the gallery in the span of two years. Some of the, the work in the entire body of work is three years worth of work. But um, the ideas behind the work um, really have their uh, roots in from the time I was a, a very small child. And those seeds were really planted um, before I was even conscious of um, what kind of ideas would be present in the painting. So um, I'm Mexican-American. Uh, my mom is from Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, my dad is from St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, when they, they got married and moved to, to the US and then had um, me and my two older brothers. I'm the youngest of three. And we grew up, I grew up in a very small town in Southern Illinois that was predominantly white and predominantly um, a, a Eastern European, or excuse me, Western European, like culturally. And um, that's how the, 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 the mirror that I saw myself through was my community being largely white. And also actually, um, while my mom is Mexican and she comes from a family with various shades of white to brown skin tone, she is very pale. And my brothers uh, are also um, ostensibly white, and I'm uh, the brown the brown girl in the family. And I didn't even really have a, a conscious sense of what that meant um, when I was a kid, and actually well into adulthood, because uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, growing up, people didn't talk about identity in the way that they do um, today, and didn't really value differences in identity. And um, <clears throat> My parents tell the story, they see it and they laugh when they tell it. It's a playful story for them. I don't know if they know knew how to process it, but uh, I don't remember this event, but when we were driving back and forth to Mexico during the summer times when I was little, and 
and one of the times driving back into the States from Mexico at the Aduana, the customs, they stopped us and because they thought my parents were trying to smuggle me, they didn't think that I was part of the family and they questioned me. And once they heard me you know, speaking, they realized that I wasn't um, a, a child they were trying to smuggle across the border who wasn't part of the family. And, and um, that, that feeling of being different uh, or others perceiving me being different when I felt I was part of the community or part of the family. And um, so, you know, it ma manifests itself in different ways. And sometimes that's kids calling names like wet back, or dark meat, things like that, taco, um, thinking they're funny. Um, but uh, there, it also, it happens in total strangers approaching you on the street or in a store demanding to know where you're from. Like, where, where are you from? And with no previously existing kind of conversations leading up to that. And I, I don't really, I don't mind talking about, I love, I'm proud of my Mexican and my American heritages, um, but to have um, others demand that question, it means they're identifying me as other than belonging. And the, the response that I, especially as a younger adult and a, um, uh, a, a young person and then a younger middle-aged adult would answer is, oh, I grew up in Illinois or I'm from East Lansing. But that's never the answer that they want to hear. They're like, no, 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 where are you really from? That's the question that almost always follows. If it's not directly like, are you Indian? Are you part black? Are you part Asian? Um, those, those questions um, from uh, strangers is really uh, the, the root of that is uh, whether it's internalized or externalized racism or othering. Um, left me with a sense of disconnect from uh, myself and from my family and my, my communities. And so um, it was around, but that wasn't something that I actually knew what was going on as a younger person. I, I felt conflict, I felt <coughs> a confusion. Because um, I, I, to myself, because I grew up in a, a white community, white family, I felt like the people I was surrounded by. But then I look in the mirror, I look at pic pictures with uh, like photographs of my family and friends, like, oh yeah, I, I am different. Um, I look different, and, but that doesn't mean I don't belong. <clears throat> so it was sometime around the beginning of the, the 2016 election cycle that I really felt a lot of anxiety um, about um, being othered and began to get language for that. I started listening to a Code Switch Club podcast that I was telling you, uh, uh, excuse me, a podcast called Code Switch. I also mess up when I get on a, <laughs> a podcast called Code Switch that talked about race and identity in America. And I'm like, oh, imposter syndrome, that's me. Oh, this is, other people have this experience too. Other kids of immigrants have, other people with, um, multicultural experiences, other people with different color skin than the predominantly like white norm, they feel like this too, I'm not alone. And so I um, started, I've always done self-portraits and um, I, I was doing some self-portraits around that time and reflecting on my own Mexicanismo, my own like um, dual cultures. Um, <clears throat> but I also was thinking about the people around me who had similar experiences, and some of them uh, were people that I knew. Like I, I teach at um, Michigan State, and so um, some of my students, some colleagues, some friends, uh, friends of uh, parents of my daughter, uh, friends, and um, I started inviting people to participate in this project. But at the time, the working title was suspended between the American reality and the American dream. <clears throat> So I was thinking about like, what is this, uh, the, the, the dream, the ideal, the American experience, and the gap in between that and my own experience and what I knew other people were experiencing. So I wanted to paint not just my story, but I wanted to paint the stories of others. And as, the, as I started making these works, and these are about half of the larger body of work um, that, that I've made so far under that title of us, I started seeing both um, you know, elements of, of, of trauma and challenges, but also elements of, of joy and solidarity. And those were the things that I felt most um, compelled by, the joy and the solidarity that I started, that started making these together. And some of them were very difficult to paint, but 
I could see more the connections between um, these people that, that were like me, that had similar kinds of gaps between what the American dream purports itself to be and what the American reality often is. So um, that's like the underpinning of um, where the, this body of, of work um, began. And so I started, again, as I mentioned, I invited uh, people to participate in my project, just kind of a, an open Facebook call or talking to, to people, hey, do you want to be part of my, my um, painting project and share your story? So um, of the people who wanted to participate, I, um, and actually the, the pandemic happened right at the beginning of the time I was starting to do the interview. So what I had hoped to do was, you know, meet everybody in person and then have them come and sit for me in my studio. Um, but what happened is I wound up doing a lot of Zoom interviews, um, but I did wind up um, getting to photograph um, uh, most of the people in the project um, personally, but I, I just let, I let them talk. You know, I told them a little bit about my experience and why um, I wanted to do this project. And um, then they shared their own experiences, and so I took a lot of notes on what they had to say, thinking about um, them as an individual and the imagery that was generated by our conversation. And I would take photographs, uh, a lot of photographs of, of the people, um, or if I couldn't, um, the, uh, Javier lived in Chicago at the time, so we, or, when we were traveling, I asked them to stage photographs. I had ideas about what I wanted um, them to do, and they would send me the photographs, and it was a very collaborative effort. <clears throat> so each of, each of these paintings is um, a collaboration between me and the people in them, and they're real people's stories, they're real people's experiences, and um, that to me is really important to um, validate those experiences as being an American norm, as being just as important as um, the predominantly white narratives, and, um, and representing lives and validating them as much as other, other narratives that we typically often see in movies, books, TV, literature, or, um, you know, the, 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 cultural, the cultural norm it shouldn't just be one kind of narrative. And so this is my contribution um, to expanding what the idea of, of the American um, story is. And so the title of the exhibition is Us, and I had people ask me, does that mean US or does that mean like us? And I was like, yes, <laughs> it is. It is US, but it's also us. Um, and I think now would be a good time to maybe talk about um, the, the paintings, um, uh, if you, and we can talk about as many of them as you like. And this one is called El Corrido de Javier Salagreda, Alegoría de los Mojados. Um, which means the a corrido is a Mexican ballad, um, which usually tells in song the epic story of sometimes a folk hero, sometimes a villain. Often contemporary corridos are um, told of, of narcos, and um, but it's, it has a very particular uh, meter and rhythm, and uh, the, the general the storylines are very epic, <clears throat> and they include all kinds of crazy details and. Uh, every little, like from uh, whoever's cousin and they, they drank coffee on Saturday or whatever, but the, the corridos are, are epic narratives. And when I interviewed Javier, um, he told me about um, his journey on foot as a 17-year-old young man uh, crossing the border, um, and in his own words, um, uh, de mojado, which um, mean, it does translate to, to wet back, which is a derogatory term that I've experienced myself, but he, that is a term that he used himself. And so that's why the Corrido of Javier Salas Vera, Allegory of the Wet Packs, that's where the title um, came from. And um, Javier told me the, the story of his crossing, which happened, he, he left at um, like 4 a.m. and it was dark on foot, um, wearing these boots, which I did a portrait of the, the boots as well as a small little painting that accompanies this, um, and wore those boots for those three days, three nights, and, um, and which is expressed, and you see these little darker passages in the painting, um, thinking about that, that long journey. 
And um, he also proceeded, we had an extreme, probably the longest conversation that I had with any of my um, participants about their stories. And he told me about the next 20 years of his life, leading up to um, the, his, his kid, which was a playmate of my daughter in preschool. So um, who's at the very end of the panel. And so I, I felt like I couldn't um, encapsulate the story in a singular panel or a simple painting because all of the details that he was telling me were really critical. And um, so I had this vision of this um, panoramic panel with this road that he was traveling on and using that as a, as a metaphor um, for his journey both across the border into the US um, and his journey through life in establishing his own American dream and meeting um, his, uh, finding you know, different jobs as a, as a young man, um, getting deported back to Mexico, finding and uh, meeting his uh, wife and getting married and having a kid, um, and becoming a successful um, uh, person with a, a satisfying life in this country. And so um, this, this painting included every, everything that I could um, about his story that I could communicate. <clears throat> and it was the only one of the paintings um, that I, I put myself in, in, and I'm here on this bicycle over here. Um, and because I, as he was telling me about his journey and coming to the US, my journey has always been looking back towards Mexico and connecting with my heritage and connecting with uh, uh, the, the Spanish language and, and um, being and feeling very close to, to my Mexican family and my Mexican um, culture. So I have um, Javier here, and then he appears a few different times um, in uh, the, actually that's not <laughs> in here, and, um, and then I'm on the road looking back the other direction. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask about this painting? There's so much yeah. in there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, would you say, and I'm not familiar with all your work, but mm -hmm. in the sense of this idea of this American dream and American reality, but the texture, the way you build up the texture with the paint and the layering effect of that, do you, you, is there any, I mean, is that based on your typical technique or does that relate to the, the layered, of a layered storyline of everyone's sort of yeah. experience. I think um, it may be both of those things. This particular painting, um, I didn't know how I was gonna compose it when I started, except that I wanted the, that road to be going all the way through it, um, and that I wanted the direction to go that way. And so um, as I, I have a small studio, so I couldn't, I didn't have it all on the wall at once. I could put two paintings up together and I was juggling all um, them. So I had two uh, always up at the same time, and like um, putting different things in at different times. And I photograph my work in progress a lot. So you see initially in the earlier stages, it was just kind of blue and orange and a lot of emptiness. And as I was going through the, and I think they gave me like 200 photographs. Um, there's the photographs that I requested they take of, of how you're just walking through, because you like walked me through his life. But there's the other photographs they gave me of him as a young man in Tamaulipas, and then um, his, his family, and, and other imagery that, that he described, but that I went and, and looked for. So it all did like begin to accumulate, and I felt there was so much that, and as I um, started thinking about like, um, the other, I really like like poetic analogy and metaphors, and and he, he actually became a food scientist. That's what his career is now. And thinking about like the plant as a metaphor, and and Tamaulipas they um, grow um, sunflowers, and um, and I was also thinking about like the <clears throat> the uh, root or the what are the like base uh, food ingredients in Mexican cuisine is corn. Um, and so I had the, the corn start to blossom here, and then he did, he slept in corn fields, hidden corn fields, but then the corn was more mature, and then the corn um, here is, is uh, ripe and ready for the picking, and then there's the baby, his son, um, being born um, out of that corn. So those, those ideas actually were generated along the way, 
and uh, weren't they, yeah, this painting like had a, acquired a lot of meaning as it developed. And I think part of that, like it acquires the first, first year of the mural. Yeah. Um, you have some of this subtle symbolism in your work. Two that catch me are A, the dog, and B, the records. Mm -hmm. What's to you? So these dogs, they sent me some old family pictures, and both of the dogs were family dogs um, uh, growing up. And um, the dog here is pointing uh, the nose towards his, his future, mm -hmm. and the dog here is, is you know, getting in the shadows and accompanying him is, is I mean, is. Yeah, before he got his papers and became a citizen, uh, for a long time, you know, living in the shadows and trying to stay under the radar. Um, they, the Javier and Miguel Carly met, um, but they, I guess about, I don't know how many years ago now, but I would say, I'd, I'd say maybe 20 years ago, and one of their first date pictures was in a diner with a little, with records. And so um, I pulled those, I don't know what the records were there, but I was thinking about some of the songs um, that I put on the records are um, songs in Spanish like uh, Cucos Sanchez and Mil Amores, A Thousand Loves. It's not really about their romance, but um, then this is Roger Miller, King of the Road. Um, the other one is La Flecha del Amor, La Sacuna del Real, the um, Arrow of Love. So it was trying to, in a like, kind of a lyrical, poetic way, bring that moment of the Polaroid out. And you know, as you move from the left to the right, the painting gets less um, uh, maybe um, rhythmic in a vertical way and more like the chaos of, of ordinary life. Do you have a question? Yes, <clears throat> your corn stalk reminds me of being symbolic of the tree of life mm -hmm. and with the fruit, all the fruits. Uh, could you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so um, I definitely, I wasn't thinking necessarily the tree of life, but I did think about it as like the, the, the ear of corn and um, the birth of this child connected. I actually had him more embedded. I mean, used to be in the, the corn, but I didn't like the way I painted his face. I couldn't get it right. And I started painting it out, and then the ear was left, like Javier's ear, and so I left that. I, I thought it was a little, a little funny, the ear of um, Javier and the ear of corn. But the food um, in the um, the containers under here, um, there he when he got his um, PhD in food science, they were part of um, uh, a, a display of some kind that had to do with uh, his presentation of his work for his oral defense. And so I, I love those as a shape um, and as a sim symbol of his um, professional evolution. But I think that also like any of food, like the bounty of those foods and the bounty in his life and um, kind of showing that the fullness as we move through, um, as we move through Javier's life is, I think that food is a really good symbolism for that, for the abundance of that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I noticed your sign, the ni aquí, ni allá. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really interesting that you put it more towards the end. What was the reason for your placement of specifically in like that, you know, those words, making it like a road sign, like why there and yeah. why there? So, ni aquí, ni allá is neither here nor there. And so I have road signs that uh, appear here. Um, Tres días, siete leguas, and then 1,620 kilometers, and that's three days, um, seven leagues, and 1,720 kilometers. And the three days, as I mentioned before, was the length of his trip, um, the first uh, crossing of the border. Siete leguas, uh, seven leagues, um, is actually the, the, the brand of, sh of boot that he wore, but I liked it as a metaphor for the leagues being a very long distance. And then I actually calculated the distance that he traveled, partially on foot, but partially Greyhound and truck, like in the back of a truck and then on Greyhound, um, the, the literal distance that he went. Um, so that's where the, the sign originated. Um, but then I was thinking when I introduced my, myself on here, the road sign for me, like it's one of the experiences that I feel is like that I'm from neither here nor there. I'm not fully American, I'm not fully Mexican. It's that like kind of in-between space. So that definitely speaks more 
um, to my personal experience, but it's also the um, internalized feelings of a lot of people who have parents from different places and, and um, especially like first generation immigrants, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and Bigger Peter featured African American mm -hmm. uh, subject matter. They both carry bags with them. So what would be the background motivation? Because it looks like you, it's one eye open mm -hmm. and uh, the other one is uh, the, the look. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this, um, those two paintings uh, on opposite ends of the gallery, um, if I knew then what I know now, and this one is one eye open, and that one's uh, the look. They are actually the, the the white woman in this painting is a childhood friend of mine. We met when we were about twelve, and um, when she went to college, um, she met her uh, then, then girlfriend, but soon to be wife, uh, Monifa, who uh, is an Afro Latina with her uh, mother based in the Dominican Republic. And when uh, they met in the late 90s, I believe, mid to late 90s, um, the, they had, Sarah had not yet met Monifa's uh, family. And so they, the story that they told me together was about this experience where Sarah saw Monifa and her sisters on the street, and she um, hadn't been in a relation, relationship that long, and jumped up um, onto Monifa playfully, but really is inserting herself in their space without warning. And uh, in that time period, uh, Sarah recounted to me that the lesbian style had a neo-Nazi kind of look. Her hair, head was shaved, she had combat boots on, she felt, uh, she looked threatening to them, but she didn't notice at the time. And she realized uh, after the fact that, um, and they had conversations about this, that as a, uh, that as a white woman, she didn't really understand her privilege. And that she didn't understand how physically inserting herself with the way that she looked um, into um, their space felt threatening to them. And they didn't know how, how to um, take that. And so in that painting, there are these hands that are crisscrossing this connection. Sarah's really pushing herself in, into that space. But one of the things that, that she talked about is their relationship, one is being a uh, biracial um, lesbian couple and um, that she has had a lot to learn about, um, about white privilege and that um, oftentimes uh, uh, black people, especially black women, as Monica described to me, have constantly live their life with one eye open even mm -hmm. when they should be because you never know where the threats are gonna come from. And so in that painting, she's got uh, Monifa's one eye um, shut and the other eye open, and, and Sarah's pushing herself into that space. And I really um, appreciated the, they, this, they live in Brooklyn, and this whole scenario took place in New York. That, and it was during the pandemic, they recreated the scenario and got uh, dressed up in coats and the, the shopping bags and, and tried to reenact that situation as they remembered it. And one of the things I found really compelling was the look that the sisters exchanged between themselves. And so I did the separate painting of the two of them um, with that knowing look like that the she, does, she doesn't really know what she's doing. And who, who is this person who thinks that they, they have that, um, just navigate through the space without those thoughts. And so that's the origin for the title of both of those because when, as they were telling me the story and Sarah said, if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> what was Ms. Hennessy showing behind playing color records in the background? Is that Astor's place? Astor's <laughs> place? Um, I, I, I can answer that question because oh. told me this all happened in front of Tower Records, so I did the literal, the literal thing. Now, is that, it was, that's not still open, is it? No. Uh, right, so that, to me, it like has this really strong, um, I have so many memories of going to Tower Records in mm -hmm. Chicago, mm -hmm. and it has this really, <laughs> I can't help but I see Tower Records, and I'm like, ah, oh, it's A different time, place. Different time, different and then also there's something, something mm -hmm. that was once there yeah. that is now gone. Yeah. So there is this lavender color and the blue that I just painted to the canvas to start with, start with the color and it sets, sometimes it sets uh, an emotional tone, sometimes it sets a tone of the time of day, sometimes it, it, it's a really strange color and I have to work against it or it sets an electric quality to the light 
that I think is really compelling. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed it, the blue, how it started um, to feel like the coldness of the, the winter and um, the purple tones in, in the skin feel, again, very removed. So there's this, um, and I like the way the red of the, the tower sign, and then I loved um, exaggerated like these red lights in the two women because if they're they're on alert and they, they don't understand or they don't know that she understands um, the kind of um, uh, threatening gesture that she's made in their personal space. So um, this painting is called The Ballad of Asia Moore, Ode to Dora Neale Hurston. And Asia was one of my students. She's now gone on to um, get her MFA. She's a practicing artist and um, she wanted to uh, share um, the, uh, one of the, the readings that she had um, that made her feel proud to be a black woman. And um, that writing by Dora Neale Hurston is how it feels to be colored me. And um, one of the lines that is perhaps more widely known in popular culture is that I, uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, I hope I'm quoting it, but I, I'm probably most likely paraphrasing, that, um, that I feel the most black when thrown against a sharp white background. And um, so when we were actually taking photographs across the street from Asia's apartment was this white uh, fence. And so we put um, her in front of the fence and she was wearing, uh, for anybody who participated, I just asked them to wear if they were comfortable in their snow guiding direct their clothing and so she she wore clothing that she felt um, proud in she wanted to show off her dress um, and and be proud of them and um, <clears throat> so I went back to that writing how it feels to be colored me which is really powerful and it has incredible imagery and it talks about the crashing waves of the Hudson and I know the Hudson doesn't crash waves this um, large but I I um, thought that there was so like the the, um, the drama of the essay and all of the little details. Um, to, she writes about a brown bag of miscellany and how she feels like um, the, the contents of that bag. And so um, all of the contents of the bag that she described, a spool of thread, a bent nail, um, an oyster knife, um, there's the, all of these different um, elements that she talks about in the writing, and so I included them on the ground um, beneath Asia. And um, she's such a, a strong uh, personality and a powerful woman, and I felt like, um, that, I don't know, that I couldn't choose between the two, um, the two poses, so I did a, the double of her. Um, but it's almost like, you know, she's, there's, there's something really confident about um, her expression, and then that rising up in front of the, the fence, which I, I made it even sharper. This, it was kind of a normal picket fence, but I wanted to emphasize its sharpness, and I wanted to emphasize its starkness, and um, her in front of that. And um, yeah, so that's, that's the elements that, that went into the, um, this painting. Karen Ma is the youngest of five. My husband's family is white, and she was fostered as a, an infant, and then they adopt her, adopted her uh, as a, a toddler. And Kira is mixed race. She um, is black and white, and probably some um, has uh, some Latino heritage as well. And um, Kira didn't want to talk as much about being mixed race. I think it made her uncomfortable in some of the ways that uh, it made me uncomfortable, but she really wanted to talk more about being an ad having an adoptive family and a birth family. And uh, her, she has uh, several birth siblings, and they're, um, they're, they're different um, fathers than the same mother. And there, she had a lot of um, complex emotions, and still does um, today, about growing up with a, with a birth family and her adoptive family, and, and wrestling with um, feeling like she was pulled in all these many directions. And, and one of the things that I wanted to communicate with um, this painting was that actually having um, all of these different branches of her family was a beautiful thing, and that her, her birth siblings 
are incredibly important to her and her adoptive family is also a support. So I made um, Kira, uh, the, the, both the trunk of the tree and her arms becoming like the branches. And with all of the, the different fruits, and these are all Michigan fruits. Um, so you've got your apples and your peaches and your cherries, but then there's also um, the lemons, which is not, not a fruit. So this, there's the different fruit, but they all come from the, the same tree. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's really the, the origin for this painting. So I had her doing, uh, we started off with doing yoga poses, like tree pose, but then it looked a little funny. So I, um, she started doing these different things with her arms that were really um, beautiful and they, they so um, wonderfully mimic the tree branches. Um, and so that's where the idea of that one came from. Sorrow. And Lillian was one of uh, my graduate students uh, from a few years ago. She's now incidentally the director of family education at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. We're very proud of Lillian. Um, but she's the daughter of a journalist and she has this very investigatory spirit about her and um, she calls herself a black historical artist. And um, one of the things that's really important to Lillian is unearthing um, stories where there's gaps in um, information about the black American experience um, beginning with uh, slavery. Um, Lillian uh, digs into historical archives of, um, for example, a large part of her MFA um, thesis work was um, using the archive uh, collection of posters advertising for runaway um, slaves. And um, so she also um, makes portraits of, has been making portraits of black elders who are important to her community, um, especially where she grew up in the Dallas area. And so thinking about all of those kind of levels of like filling in these gaps in the historical record and um, filling in gaps in the, like the, um, the contemporary cultural record. And at the time um, that I was making this painting, um, there was, um, George Floyd had been recently murdered, and I was thinking about other gaps um, that were in black um, culture. And so I started in these, um, anywhere where I could, where there was room to write, um, the, there's the name, the birth date, the death date, and how um, a, a black person was killed at the hands of an authority figure, most often police officers. And um, the implication is that, uh, so I've got that written everywhere where you can see, but the, the stacks behind her are um, filled with those um, acts of, of, of injustice. And um, so, so I wanted this painting to reflect that uh, Lillian um, it unearths those stories, but also points people towards black joy. Um, and some of her artwork is featured um, in the, uh, the painting as well. And um, what I, I, use, I like to use like uh, food and plants and birds and things like that often in my work as symbols. And so there are um, the flowers. I don't remember all of the symbolism as I chose them, but this is a forget-me-not. Um, I'm not sure what the dandelion represents like in flower culture, but to me, like uh, uh, living in um, East Lansing, people consider it a weed, so I envisioned her as like stomping out the weeds of racism. Um, and uh, the blue jay as a, um, has a call of like an alarm call and the owl with wisdom and so I saw the, those birds representing um, some of the values of Lillian in her quest for her artwork to bring attention and value to black lives um, uh, both in the past uh, record and also in the, the present day. So I, I love the way she's casually, this is very Lillian like pulling down her, her glasses and it's a knowing, a knowing look. Um, and she's very ambitious and um, hardworking and is already um, with her work making a significant impact on 
really having these unearthed stories become more um, uh, visible, not just to black communities, but to all communities. Any questions or other questions about this one? I have one that's yeah. kind of about the painting. Yeah. You said you um, underpaint pretty much everything with mm -hmm. women of colors. What, what are the underpaints for? The, the yellow, that yellowy green, and then there's some teal. Most of the teal got covered up, but um, I brought some of it back. But the yellow, that's that's underpainting right there. Is that you can see the canvas right through there. And I, I love leaving um, those colors at times. Again, they change the mood or create a light. Um, and this one has a very like electric uh, feel to it and um, almost creates a, a halo of yellow around the woman. Brittany uh, is the daughter of a Korean um, born but adopted into a white family, her, her father and her mother is white. Um, and so since he was adopted as an infant and into a white family, that he has no connection to um, the Korean cultural heritage. Um, and he, um, so he wasn't able to bring any of that. He grew up um, with, uh, a, a, with, with American like kind of white cultures as part of um, you know, his, his experience, so it was his experience. And um, Brittany and her sister, uh, they are biracial, and Brittany always felt more like racially ambiguous that she saw her sister looked more Korean than her, and she always struggled, um, not unlike me, with the constant questioning of the who are you, what are you kind of things, and felt very, very different and detached, and, and also um, sad that she did not have that organic connection to um, Korean customs and um, the language that she wished that she could have had uh, under different circumstances. And one of the things that Brittany mentioned to me, and this is the first that I started learning about it, is the Doljanchi ceremony that when Korean babies uh, turn one, traditionally the parents and um, have a celebration where they set out objects in front of the baby and the baby crawls to the objects and whichever one they grab um, is the uh, a symbol of what their destiny is. And so um, the gavel uh, for the judge is like wisdom, there's a paintbrush uh, for artistry, the money obviously wealth, um, food, abundance. There's a whole different array of traditional objects um, and uh, there's also like traditional historical objects and then traditional contemporary objects that people will um, will will set out for their um, their child for the ceremony. And um, I asked Brittany, so we recreated that uh, she I had her crawl. Um, this was still in the pandemic, so we were all afraid to go to people's houses. But I had um, Brittany crawling. Uh, in the grass in my uh, front yard, try recreating the Doljanchi ceremony, so reaching out for what object. And I asked her if she um, could have anticipated what she might have chosen, what her destiny would be, and she said love, which is not a traditional um, object or destiny from the, um, the objects that pe people normally put out. So, but I, I put a heart um, in, in the, the array that she would grab. And as, as you move from the left to the right in this picture, in the picture plane, there's her family um, and they're celebrating. And then as she reaches towards the objects, um, the Doljapi objects, the people begin to be less um, the, depicted and more abstracted. And then uh, a faceless um, uh, hands were wearing traditional Korean garb and making, there's this pop culture thing called um, finger hearts. Uh, it's a Korean thing, and with your thumb and forefinger, it crosses into a little heart shape. And so I included the little uh, finger heart, also representing that notion of love. Um, but the, the hand of the, the, um, the unknown person, thinking, I was thinking about her, di the disconnect, but it's reaching out towards her. It almost touches, but not quite. There's still that distance between uh, what she'll never know about um, her Korean um, ancestors, but that she is becoming closer through this act of um, reliving the Doljanchi ceremony. 
And one of the things that um, made me really happy to hear after um, Brittany um, became pregnant and had a daughter, not too long after I made this painting, and when her daughter turned one, she did the Bill Johnchi ceremony for her daughter and tried to bring back um, the, uh, the, what was once a lost connection between her Korean culture and her life and bringing that, inviting it back into her life. So that's the, the origin of that painting. Again, I just want to say thank you so much uh, to Teresa Dunn for sharing her uh, powerful and beautiful, thoughtful uh, paintings with us today. And also thank you to the Smallage family. Uh, without the Smallage family, um, this lecture series uh, would not be with us here at Welcome Gallery. So thank you. Have a great day.